Pardon me. I beg your pardon. I hate to interrupt this conversation, but it's almost time for the Calling All Cars program on the radio, and that's one program I never miss. Do you folks mind if I tune it in? No, no, by all means. We'd like to listen, too. We often hear it at home. Let's see. What company sponsors that Calling All Cars program? The Rio Grande Oil Company. Oh, yes, Rio Grande. I never can remember. Well, you're a fine one. Here, Rio Grande spends thousands of dollars to entertain you, and you don't even know that they sponsor Calling All Cars. Well, if you like their program, at least you ought to buy a Rio Grande gasoline. Listen, Harry, I buy the cheapest gasoline I can get. That's good enough for me. That's what I used to think, Ed. But when I heard that so many cities were specifying Rio Grande cracked gasoline for police cars and fire trucks and emergency engines, I decided that I might as well enjoy some of that police car performance in my old bus. Well, I found out that while Rio Grande cracked gasoline with tetraethyl doesn't cost any more than any other quality gasoline, it does cost about two cents more than the cheapest gasoline. So I decided to keep a record and see if Rio Grande would really give me better mileage, and, well, I found that it did. <laughs> now I suppose you're going to tell me that, in addition, it rejuvenated your car. I'm mighty near it. It seems to be such a lively gasoline. It starts the engine almost instantly, and it doesn't stall and die. I don't have to keep using the choke at all. And since I've been using Rio Grande cracked gasoline, my car seems so much peppier. It's faster. I go over lots of hills and high now, and why, even on that steep Olive Street hill, I can breeze over in second gear. I used to be afraid I couldn't make it in low. Hold it, Harry. Here comes the program. Calling All Cars, the presentation of the Rio Grande Oil Company, starring Evelyn Knapp, lovely blonde motion picture actress, in the role of Mrs. Doblin. Los Angeles Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Broadcast 52 regarding a murder. The unidentified body of a murdered man found under a bridge on Angeles Mesa Drive. The victim's cufflinks bore the initials MFD. Follow up on this, boys. That's so, all. Rose and Cliff. Now our pleasure to present Chief James E. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department. Chief Davis. Good evening, friends. There is a camaraderie in police work which is akin to that of soldiers in battle. When you have spent long hours with your brother officer attempting to solve the apparently insoluble, when you have perhaps even faced death with him, a feeling of fraternity is created that is one of the greatest compensations in police work. And this camaraderie is not listed to the members of any single force, but often extends to officers of other cities. In the case you are about to hear tonight, the circumstances of the crime threw me in contact with an inspector of detectives in Oakland. His name was Bodie Wallman, and he was a mighty fine detective. Today, he is chief of police, the contacts I had with Bodie Wallman while working on that case made for me a lifelong friend. Tonight's case is as much Bodie's as it is mine. So I have asked Bodie to say hello from up north. Friends, I am proud to introduce to you my comrade and brother officer, Chief Bodie Wallman of Oakland. Jim, and thanks for the send-off. Good evening, friends of the West. I feel honored to appear on Calling All Cars and to contribute my part to this program, which I feel is such a definite factor in educating the public to a keener appreciation of its friend, the policeman. Our work never ends. We are figuratively and very often actually on duty 24 hours a day. If the vigilance of your policeman relaxes, if he is suddenly stopped performing his multiplex duties, the result would be chaos, a picture too horrible to dwell upon. But your policeman will not let you down. The type of a man who guards a piece of your communities is called to a high purpose. He is proud of the responsibility you place upon him. He is worthy of your trust. 
I will not say anything regarding the case you are about to hear dramatized, excepting that it was a pleasure to work on it with Jim Davis. And now, there is a company of splendid actors awaiting to tell you our story. On with the show. The story tonight goes back to the time when the fashionable Wilshire district of Los Angeles was still a subdivider's dream. And the proud streets and broad boulevards that are today lined with smart shops and beautiful mansions were a desolate waste of empty lots intersected by unused streets, studded by lonely, albeit ornate, lampposts. One bright October morning, a street sweeper pursuing his relatively easy task shoves broom and cart toward a real estate office near the corner of Bronson and Country Club Drive. St. Louis woman with a diamond ring Pull that gal around by the apron Well, tree. good morning, Hubert. Good morning, Miss Parker, ma'am. And how are things with you? Well, you know, Miss Parker, I don't like this job much. I think I'm going to get me a new one. Places is too far between out here. This here job gives me... Oh, Miss Parker, Miss Parker, for the love of heaven, look here. What is it, Hubert? Do you see the same thing I think I see down there in the gutter? A hat with a bullet hole in it and a blood-stained floor mat from an automobile. Yes, ma'am, that's just what I thought it was. Don't leave me here, Miss Parker. Oh, where, where are you all going? I'm going to call the police. With evidence that seems to point clearly to murder, police are baffled with the attempt the next step. The grizzly hat and floor mat offer no clues save the initials NFD in the hat band. No one with those initials has recently been reported missing. No dead body is found. As the days go by, the evidence becomes more and more of a mystery. Then two weeks later, a couple of truck drivers are eating their lunch in the shade under a bridge on Angeles Mesa Drive. Well, now, let's let's have some of the old lady's sandwiches. Now, what do we got here? Yeah, we got ham and roast beef. What do you want? Well, I'll take roast beef. Yeah. Like those she had last week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey. Hey, Charlie, the, there's a guy lying over there. Where? Oh, yeah. Oh, some old drunk sleeping it off, probably. Hey, here's a stick. Uh, let, let's bang the soles of his feet with it and act like we are cops. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Go ahead, smack him. Hey, you snap out of it. Hey. Ed! Huh? He ain't drunk. He's dead. The two astonished truck drivers call the police, and the body is quickly taken to the morgue. Chief of Police Louis D. Oakes assigns Detectives Davis, Longevin, and Klein to handle the case. They discuss their meager findings in the office of the homicide detail. They certainly didn't leave us much to go on. Yeah, I should say not. A 380 slug from an automatic and a gold coupling with the initials NFD on it. NFD? Hey, wait a minute. That sounds familiar, Jim. What do you mean? Now, just a minute while I look through these old reports. Yeah, it is. What? Remember that hat that was found with a bullet hole in it out on Country Club Drive a couple of weeks ago? Yes. It had the initials NFD in the hat band. Well, so far, so good. We now have the victim in his hat. But we're still a long way from his identity. Yeah, and remember, the missing person's file didn't show anyone with those initials. Well? Well, that would appear to indicate that the victim is not a resident of Los Angeles. That's right. Now, first, we'd better release a complete description to the press and see if some citizen can't help us identify the body. This suggestion of Detective Davis is quickly acted upon. The following morning, papers carry the description and request for identification to every part of the state. Shortly after Inspector Detective Wallman of Oakland arrives at his office, a very excited young woman enters. Oh, Inspector, Inspector, I just read in the paper. I need your help. My husband... Now, just a minute, ma'am. One thing at a time. Uh, what did you read in the papers? Oh, this... this piece. Oh, about that body found in Los Angeles, yes? I... I... Oh, I can't tell you. You can't tell me what, ma'am? Oh, come on. You you came here to tell me something. What is it? I, I'm afraid. Oh, I'm afraid it's my husband. 
Your husband? <laughs> well, what makes you think so? Oh, it says here in the paper that they found initials on a gold cufflink. Yes, the initials were <laughs> NFD. Those are his initials. What is his name? Nicholas F. Stoblick. I gave him a pair of gold cufflinks last Christmas. Oh. <laughs> now, now, please, Mrs. Dobrik. Oh. Uh, you must control yourself. Oh, yes, yes. I'll, I'll try. Now then, how long has your husband been missing? Well, he, he left home over two weeks ago. When exactly? October 17th, I think it was. Did he say where he was going? Yes, he, he was going to a meeting in Portland. And you've not heard from him since? No. Only a postcard from him from San Jose the day he left. Uh, did your husband have any money on him when he left? He always carries a lot of money. I think he had five or six hundred dollars. Anything else of value? Yes. A four-carat diamond ring. Four carats, eh? The body found in Los Angeles had no money or jewelry on it save the one cufflink. And then they robbed Nick. Oh, they stole in his diamond ring as well as murdered it. Uh, now, now, Mrs. Dowdy. Did he have any enemies? No. None that I knew of. Or was there anyone who knew his habits who might have done this? I can't think of... Oh, well, there was Jim Allen. Jim Allen? Who's he? He was a friend of Nick's. He lived with us for a while. Well, have you any reason to suspect him of the murder of your husband? Well, that is, if this victim is your husband. Well, no, not exactly, but... Now, please, Mrs. Davlitz, you uh, don't hold anything back on me. Well, once while he was living with us, I had a little fight with Nick. And Jim told me how to get Nick's diamond and walk out on it. Yes. He offered to slug Nick and get the diamond from him. And what did you say to that? I, I refused, of course. I told him he'd better get out. Now, Mrs. Davlitz... If your husband was on his way to Portland, what makes you think he should be found murdered in Los Angeles? I don't know, but I'm sure that it's Nick. Will you be willing to go to Los Angeles and try to identify the oh, body? Yes, yes, of course. Oh, very well. I'll arrange that. And you'd better start looking for Jim Allen. Find him and you'll find Nick's diamond ring. And when you do, you'll have Nick's murderer. <laughs> Mrs. Doblich is taken to Los Angeles, where she identifies the cuff link and the clothes as those of her husband. A few days later. Operator. Operator, get me to the police station and hurry it up, please. Police department. Sergeant Keller speaking. This is Edward Warren, manager of the Oakland Motor Company. Yes? A man's in my place here trying to trade me a diamond ring for an automobile. Yeah? He seems in an awful hurry. It looks mighty suspicious to me. Well, you stall him along and we'll send a couple of men over to talk to him. The suspicious salesman stalls the buyer with details of contracts and bills of sale until Oakland police arrive. They escort the protesting suspect to headquarters, where Inspector Wallman questions him. What's your name? James Allen. And where do you live? With my wife on Mariposa Street. I don't care. I'd like to know the reason for this outrage. I haven't done anything. No one's accusing you of doing anything. We just want to ask you a few questions. You must admit it's a little unusual for a man to attempt to buy an automobile with a diamond ring. Now, where'd you get that diamond? A friend of mine gave it to me. A security for some dough I lent him in a poker game in Emeryville. Have you ever been in Los Angeles? Yeah, a couple of times. Were you in Los Angeles a couple of weeks ago? No. Do you know Nicholas Dablik? No. Your name's James Allen, isn't it? That's right. Well, Mrs. Dablish says that one James Allen is a good friend of her husband. Well, maybe so. There are more than one James Allen in the world. Well, Mrs. Dablish's description of her husband's diamond ring fits this ring here. Well, there are lots of identical diamond rings, too. Yes, but isn't it a coincidence that another James Allen would have another diamond ring identical with the one worn by Nicholas Dablish when he was murdered in Los Angeles? Say, I don't know what this is all about, but you can't pin a rap on me for murdering a man I never heard of. Allen, your story doesn't sound right to me. I'm going to hold you on suspicion. Personally, I have a very strong hunch that you murdered your friend, Nicholas Dablich. While police await Mrs. Dablich's return, Inspector Wallman conducts an investigation of Allen's background. Detective Flynn is reporting some of his findings to his superior. Well, Booty, I got some more dope on that guy. Yeah, what would you find? I've been talking to Mrs. Allen. I found out several interesting things. First, Allen is an alias... His real name is Forrest Cecil Mingle. Did you check him in our records under that name? Yeah, but he hasn't a record here. However, I've already sent to the Department of Justice in Washington to see if they have. Good. What else did you find? Mrs. Allen's brother has been running around with Allen. 
Well, he disappeared a couple of weeks ago. And what's his name? Jack Bowen. Got a record? No, but he's been in the Navy. Oh, in the Navy? No, I've already sent to the Navy Department for fingerprints and description. Fine. What else? Well, uh, this name in Allen's address book. Esther Stone, North Gower Street, Los Angeles. Better get Davis in Los Angeles to look up this girl, see what she knows about Allen. Yeah, I'll do that right away. A few hours later, Davis interviews Hester Stone, and by the time he returns to headquarters, Washington has replied to Flynn's query, and the case against Allen is mounting. Well, Jim, how'd you come out with the Stone girl? Fine. She knows Allen, and she was out riding with him on the afternoon of October 17th. Good. That places him in Los Angeles around the time of the murder. How about this girl? Was she tied up in it? No, I don't think so. She's a pretty fine person. I don't think she had a thing to do with it. Will she testify against Allen if we bring him to trial? Oh, no, yes. That's fine. And I got some good news while you were out. What's that? Allen, under the name of Mingle, was sentenced for life to Oklahoma State Penitentiary in McAllister for murder some years ago. Yeah? What kind of a murder? He bumped off a woman in a public park for her diamonds. Well, up to his old tricks again, huh? Yeah, but what I can't understand is he's out on parole now. Out on parole, right? But get this. He admitted to Wallman that he had been gambling when he tried to pull that alibi about possessing the ring. So on his own confession, he's a parole violator, eh? Right. And if we don't send him up for murder, we'll send him back to McAllister for the rest of his sentence. Well, that's some consolation. Yep. But I want to send him up from here. And so do I. Detective Longevin goes to Oakland and brings Allen back with him. In the detective bureau, Allen faces the Los Angeles officer. You guys are getting yourself in an awful jam. When I get out of here, I'm going to sue you and Bodie Wallman for false arrest. You pay for that. Now, quiet down, Allen. You can't bellow your way out of this. We know you came down to Los Angeles on the 17th of October. I did not. That's a lie. You can't prove it. Can't we? Longevin, bring that young lady in, will you? Right. Come in, Miss Stone. Do you recognize this man? Yes. That's Jim Allen. Now, will you tell us when you last saw him? It was on the 17th of October. He called for me in an automobile, and we took a ride. He brought me back home at about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Thank you. That's all, Miss Stone. Well, that places you in Los Angeles the day Nicholas Dablish was murdered. Yeah? How much you paying her to make that statement? She's telling the truth. She's lying. I never saw her before. Why don't you save us a lot of time and tell us exactly how you murdered Nicholas Dablish? I never murdered him or anyone else. How about that woman you murdered in Oklahoma for her diamonds? I don't know what you're talking about. You deny murdering Nicholas Dablish? Yes. Bring in that other witness. Now, Mr. Moore, do you recognize this man? Yes, he rented a Maxwell touring car from me on October 17th. Was the car returned in the same condition as it was rented? No, the floor mat was missing from the rear. Yeah. The blood-stained mat we discovered the next day at Country Club in Bronson is the same mat, is it not? I believe so. Thank you, Mr. Moore. That's all for the present. Well, Alan? Hmm, you certainly got a nice little frame-up all built, haven't you? Well, it won't work. You got a witness to prove I was in Los Angeles. Another witness to prove that I rented a car. And another witness to prove that the mat from the car was blood-stained. You think you're pretty smart, don't you, Copper? No, just thorough. Yeah, well, you haven't got a thing on me. You can't prove that I murdered Nicholas Dablich. You can't even prove that I knew him. I'll call that bluff. Come in a moment, Mrs. Dablich. You recognize this man? Hello, Jim. Huh? I don't know you. This I never saw to... this woman before. No, don't talk like that. This isn't going to do you any good, Jim. You murdered Nick, your best friend. You will hang for Hey, look here. I, I ain't going to stand for any more of this. I got constitutional rights. You can't railroad me. You got a lot of paid witnesses building up circumstantial evidence. It won't do you any good. There isn't a jury in the world that'll convict me. I got a case, too. I'll beat you guys in court, and then I'll squeeze you in a nice, juicy little damage suit. I am sick of hearing your threats, Alan. Are you going to admit the murder of Nicholas Dablich? I am not. Very well. Take him back to his cell, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Come along. And um, thank you, Mrs. Abbott. Is there anything else I can do? If there is, we'll let you know. Good day. Ah, uh, you know, Longevin, Alan's right. We can't convict him on the case we have now. I know it. We have no witnesses of the crime, and we're not in possession of the weapon. Our only hope is his brother-in-law, this Jack Bowen. Well, our descriptions are out. We'll just have to wait until he's picked up. We can't stay Alan's trial forever. Don't worry about the trial yet. We may not even get an indictment against him. There's no doubt about it, sir. We're... Getting on thin ice. 
And yet there's no question in my mind about Alan's guilt. Mine either. Beg pardon, sir, but this telegram just come for you. Ah, uh, thanks, sir. Yeah. Well, Longerman, our troubles are over. Yeah? Who's that from? The chief of police of Indianapolis. He just picked up Bowen there as a bag, and he's holding him for us. Herman Klein goes to Indianapolis for Bowen. On the long train ride back to Los Angeles, Klein continually tries to get Bowen to talk, but fails. After their arrival in Los Angeles, Davis offers to take over the questioning by himself. Hour after hour, throughout an afternoon and evening, all that night, he pounds questions at the taciturn Bowen. Both men are haggard, worn. In their shirt sleeves, they sit facing each other across the desk, hour after hour. Finally, as the black squares of the windows, which had yawned above them all night, are turning to gray and becoming less ominous. <sighs> but you were in Los Angeles on October 17th. I wasn't. You can't prove it. I wasn't in California. I've been in the East for three months. Listen, Bowen. We're both tired. All right, then cut out this third degree and let's get some sleep. Third degree? Have I so much as touched you tonight? No, but... You think because I'm making you sit up all night asking you questions, I'm giving you the third degree. Don't you suppose it's as hard for me to stay up thinking up questions as it is for you to stay up thinking up lies? I'm not lying. You are lying. You said that you'd been east for three months, that you weren't in Los Angeles on October 17th. You lie. Your sister, Alan's wife, has stated that you were living with them until about the 20th of October... Esther Stone has stated that she went riding with Alan and another man whose name she didn't know on the afternoon of October 17th. Now, you were that other man. Uh, I was not. Esther Stone has identified Alan. She's described you. She'll identify you when she sees you. All right, come on, Jack. Start talking. Let's get this thing over and call it a day. You know you were here on October the 17th. Now, come clean. Well, all right, I was down here. Alan and I went riding with the broad. That's all true. And how about the murder of Nick Dablett? Listen, I don't want to think. You're not thinking. You're just saving your own neck. You're getting some sleep for yourself. Because I can assure you I'll sit here until you tell me the truth if it takes three months. Maybe if you talk and talk straight, it'll help you. Well, oh, gee, I... All right, come on, come on, spill it. We know that you took Hester Stone on a ride that afternoon. You left her about five o'clock. Now, we know from the investigation of Inspector Wallman in Oakland that Nick Dablich took the train for Los Angeles from San Jose early on the morning of the 17th. He arrived in Los Angeles at 8.10 that night. Now, you and Alan met him at the train, didn't you? Yes. Well, then what'd you do? Well, Alan told Dablich that he had a swell dame he wanted him to meet. Dablich was all ready for a party, so he started out from the station. We drove for a long time till we got way out on Angeles Mesa Road. Yeah. Well, Dablish was suspicious, and he wanted to know what was the big idea. If this dame lived in San Diego or what? Uh-huh. And then, just about that time, Alan said, All right, Nick, give me that diamond. He made a grab for the rock. Dablish started a fight, and Alan whipped out the rod and let him have it. Where's that gun now? Hidden behind his shelf in Alan's garage in Oakland. All right. All right, what happened after you shot Dablish? I didn't shoot him. Alan did. All right. What happened? Well, and Alan stuffed Dablish into the car, and we... We drove out onto a bridge and we dumped him over. A little further on, we looked around the rear with a flashlight and we found Dablich's hat and that floor mat, so we threw them out. But I didn't know anything about it. What do you mean you didn't know anything about well, it? I didn't know Alan was going to bump off Dablich. I, I didn't even know about the ring. Alan just told me he wanted to take Dablich out on some lonely road and beat him up. Why? I don't know. I guess he had a grudge against him or something. All I did was drive the car. Yeah, well, that was enough. Yeah, but don't you see? I'm no murderer. I wouldn't have done it if I'd known what Jim had in her mind. I'm on the level. Oh, listen, you won't send me up for murder, will you, Lieutenant? you got to promise me that. you got to promise me. I can't me. promise you anything. On the basis of Bowen's confession, we had a splendid case against Allen. Both men pled not guilty and were brought to t- trial before Judge Fricky. At that time, the judge said he had never seen a better prepared case. This was due to a great extent to the excellent investigation of my friend, Bodie Wallman, now chief of police of Oakland. The jury was out 31 hours and then failed to reach an agreement because one of the jurors claimed that Allen was a member of his lodge and therefore could not be guilty. On the second trial, Allen pled guilty but claimed insanity. 
while Bowen pled guilty to perjury of his confession in the former trial. The court found Alan sane and sentenced him to San Quentin for the rest of his natural life, which ended when death came for him in 1929. The man we have called Bowen was sentenced to from 1 to 14 years on a charge of perjury and was paroled after four years. As is almost always the case with our two lax parole system, Bowen was soon once more in trouble and after many scrapes with the law, was finally sentenced in Spokane, Washington for the violation of the Federal Dyer Act. Thank you, Chief Davis. Los Angeles Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Cancellation broadcast 52 regarding a murder. Suspects in this case are now in custody. That's all. Rolls and quit. Well, you turn off the radio, Harry. That's all I want to hear. Gee, that was a thriller. You've got to hand it to Rio Grande. They certainly put on an interesting show. Yes, and like a lot of other folks, you let yourself be entertained for a half hour and then won't even listen for a minute while they tell you about their gasoline. That's not fair. Oh, I guess you're right. You can turn it on again if you want to. Police cars need greater speed and greater power than ordinary automobiles. That's why so many cities in California and Arizona have made competitive tests and selected Rio Grande cracked gasoline for their police cars, fire trucks, ambulances, motorcycles, and other emergency engines. Why should you be satisfied with anything less than police car performance in your own car? You can get Rio Grande cracked gasoline with tetraethyl the same gasoline that police cars use at the independent Rio Grande service station near you. It costs no more. Well, Harry, I don't know whether it's you or the radio, but I'm sold. I'll drive into a Rio Grande service station on my way home tonight, and I'll fill up with that cracked gasoline. Good boy, Ed. That's the way to show Rio Grande that you like that program. And be sure to tell the dealer that you're buying Rio Grande gasoline because you like the Calling All Cars radio program. Calling All Cars, based upon authentic confidential police files, is written and produced by William N. Ropes. 